Hi, and uh, welcome to another entry of Anthropological Inquiries. Um, we are here with today with Dr. Anna I I Isovic. I I'm sorry, can you pronounce your name for me? I apologize for that. <laughs> sure. Hi, my name is Anna Ivasuk. Ivasuk, okay. So tell us a little bit about yourself today. Oh, oh real quick first, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with the format, what we do typically is a 30 to 40 minute interview here with discussion with the anthropologist and the research, and then we hold question and answer session. Uh, you're welcome to ask questions at any time, and we will address them during the question and answer session. So, uh, so let's get started. Um, uh, Anna, can you tell us about yourself, uh, what you do as an anthropologist and your area of research that you focus on? Sure. So I'm a social anthropologist and I have started my research uh, in anthropology with the Roma. Uh, in my doctoral research, I have uh, carried out an ethnography um, in, the, in the field of the anthropology of development. And I followed the conflicts that arose during the implementation of a World Bank funded project of community development in about 100 communities of Roma in Romania. Uh, focusing on the way in which the Roma actually have their own projects of social mobility that run some, sometimes counter to the policies and the projects that are being implemented in order to promote their social inclusion. So that was my, my doctoral research. And from there, I moved on to uh, the topic of uh, security or rather insecurity. Uh, and I have studied the securitization of the Roma um, in the peripheries of Rome, meaning how the Roma, especially those um, that are part of, of the most poor uh, segments uh, and those that originated in migration waves from Eastern Europe uh, starting in the 60s are being constructed and governed as a threat, as a security threat. And so I ended up doing an ethnography of formal and informal policing and it is rather the phenomenon of informal policing which really caught my attention uh, because it is a new it is a, a newly uh, emerged phenomenon in Europe. There is not so much um, ethnographic research about uh, forms of informal policing in Europe. There is a lot, of course, in the context of the so-called global south, um, but not so much in Europe because um, it is re-emerging. Uh, and it, it is really important to um, to take a look at what's happening right now in the context of, you know, we had in 2015 the so-called migration crisis, uh, which I actually contest because it's not a migration crisis, it was a, a crisis of reception uh, of refugees rather than a really migration crisis. And um, it's really important to take a look at what's going on in the context of the intersection between informal policing and the far right and how both of them uh, work together. So what is informal policing? Let me just start by, by maybe explaining that, sure, right? Yeah. So we all know what formal policing means. It's when the function of social control and crime control is being carried out by the state uh, in its institutions like the police or the military police, which exists in, in a few European countries. Now, when we talk about informal policing, we talk about common citizens like you and me, or maybe maybe not like you and me, but people with a certain mindset um, that is kind of focused on insecurity, and they run uh, with the narrative that insecurity is, is growing, that crime is on the rise everywhere, that every everybody and everything is being threatened, in particular uh, through the presence of uh, migrants who are very visible, of course, and who are the first scapegoats um, in the context of social control, right? And so it's citizens that mobilize in order to protect their neighborhoods or border areas. Like in the US, for example, you have the phenomenon of informal policing with the border patrols mm -hmm. in the South. That is very known. And in the context of the US, this phenomenon has been there for a longer time than, than in Europe, as it has also been in the UK, where community uh, policing and um, you know, forms of informal policing, like neighborhood watch. Neighborhood watch is also a form, of, a form of informal policing, but it's less active than the actual patrols that run on the streets. Uh, so in the UK and in the US, we already know this phenomenon, and there is research about that, but in, in the continental areas of Europe, 
it is a newly emerging phenomenon. However, obviously, before the police existed uh, within the context of the state, this function had to be carried out as well. And so it's not new, but what is happening right now is building up upon uh, traditions of these kinds of informal policing in different countries, right? So before the police existed, it was already uh, a form of citizen policing that was taking place that we can, that historical studies trace back to the Middle Ages, right? Um, in Italy, for example, the um, this this kind of informal policing uh, happened uh, with the proto-fascist uh, patrols. So it was uh, far-right uh, patrols that were um, looking for their political opponents, for trade union leaders and uh, leftists, um, and being very violent against them. So sometimes these this phenomenon borders on vigilantism. And there is always the threat of violence, violence against those perceived as not belonging, those. Anna, did we lose you for a moment? I, you're muted. Yes, sorry, I don't know what happened. I disconnected. I'm, I'm back. Yes. So, you know, go alongside that. Uh, would uh, organizations like um, or hate groups like the Ku Klux Klan are they considered? Yes, I think I think so. I think uh, in you know, in as much as they were actively pursuing and lynching people on the streets, yes, absolutely. It is a form of social control. It is a form of normalizing violence against certain people that are or certain groups actually that are perceived as not non-belonging or criminal. I don't know if I was already cut when I was talking about the fact that, you know, these kinds of informal policing really focus on people who are uh, perceived as being different and who are very often criminalized. And I think in the context of, of Europe, um, really the, the traditional scapegoat is the Roma figure, uh, a figure that was perpetually criminalized. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in that vein, tell us who are the Roma? Um, so tell us a little bit about their background. I know they're obviously not a heterogeneous population, but uh, give us a description of, uh, of their culture and who they are and how they fit into this whole discussion. Right. I mean, I couldn't possibly give a description of the culture in such a short time, but it, it is the, the word Roma is actually an umbrella term um, that brings together very, very different groups uh, with different languages, different traditions, different cultures, therefore, uh, different denominations, different um, religions, uh, religious backgrounds as well, and different languages. So uh, even though there have been attempts and there is a, a unified Romani language, which is the literal language, there are many dialects and some of the, of the groups don't really understand each other. Um, so... Um, yeah, and in you know we were talking about that. If I can already uh, talk about that, we were talking about the the word gypsy, right? Because many many people use the word gypsy without actually knowing that it is a slur, and it is a slur because it has taken on such negative connotations in the everyday use of language. <laughs> And for example, in Romania, the, um, there were already Roma organizations uh, at the beginning of the last century that were already advocating for people not to call them gypsies anymore. So, you know, the word Roma is not, an, uh, is not a new word like certain people think it is. Uh, and so, the, you know, the Roma are just like everybody else um, looking for better opportunities. And because in many uh, countries they are um, socially marginalized and discriminated against, um, they try their, their luck somewhere else. Um, it is true that at some at a certain point, because of the persecution that they were uh, suffering, they were uh, forced to uh, certain forms of nomadism. But this nomadism has almost disappeared completely, except for some groups in the UK, some in France and some in Spain. But other than that, uh, you know, for example, in Italy, where the Roma are erroneously referred to as nomadi, uh, nomadism is virtually non-existent. And if there are 
forms of nomadism, there are forms of uh, economic nomadism that are uh, actually related to, uh, you know, where the robot can find a job, uh, they, they move uh, in search for, for markets. I don't know if my connection... Oh, here we go. Oh, there, okay, you're back. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, and you're also, I think, muted again. So, or let's see, are you muted? No, I don't know. Okay, go ahead. Right. Okay, there you are. So I don't. So you, don't you actually cut gonna... off when you said we were. You thought you were losing connection. So we we did get that that whole portion in. Okay. Um, okay. So Great. my next question for you is these Roma camps. Uh, you talk about a lot about the Roma camps and, and you spending time there. Uh, is it Camp Nomadi? Is that how you, uh, uh, Com Compi Nomadi? Is that how you, you pronounce it? Uh, so tell us a little bit about that and, and how does that um, relate to this uh, kind of idea of security and informal policing and, and all that stuff. So tell us about that in your work. Right. So Campi Nomadi in Italy have been implemented as a policy, as a housing policy for the poorer segments of, of the Roma population. So not all the Roma in Italy live in Campi Nomadi. About 20-25% of them do live in these camps and it really is the most marginalized segment. Um, and this policy was implemented by Italy following uh, recommendations from the Council of Europe in the 60s and 70s in the middle of multiculturalist policies and having as example the UK and France, which had uh, advocated for the protection of the nomadic culture of these groups, right? So at that point, nomadism was a little bit more pronounced uh, in the UK and, and in France, um, not really that much in Italy. So Italians actually misunderstood the whole thing and took the Roma because they had migrated from Eastern Europe um, notably from countries of, uh, I mean, from Yugoslavia, right? Um, Bosnia, Serbia, um, and so on. They mistook the Roma for nomads. The thing is as well that when the Roma started migrating to Italy from uh, Yugoslavia, they were already sedentarized for the most part. Um, you know, the proportion of sedent uh, sedentary Roma to, to nomadic Roma was about 90 some percent uh, were sedentary. So Italians completely misunderstood the whole thing. And so they called them nomadi. And um, it is very telling that until 2011, the institution that was dealing with Roma and Sinti issues in Italy was called uh, the, you know, office for the, for the nomads, right? So it, it actually percolated very late in, in the Italian uh, administration that this wasn't uh, the right term. Although the Roma, of course, had been advocated against it for a long time. And these Campi Nomadi, there are several kinds of Campi Nomadi. Some are authorized and set up actually by the state with, uh, but they are, they are always, set up in very remote areas, so far away from residential areas, in very dubious uh, territory that could have been uh, polluted before or industrial areas, uh, very poorly connected uh, in terms of transport and infrastructure. And the infrastructure is very often faulty. That means that, you know, you have um, sewage that breaks very often and that isn't repaired on time so there is uh, you know the, there's uh, there are a lot of smells um, and the authorities do not um, do not serve these these communities as often as they do others so for example there are heaps of waste that accumulate on the margins of the camps and so this infrastructural neglect and service neglect from the part of the state is very often misinterpreted by uh, Italians as being uh, the Roma that are dirty and that are impure, of course. And now we know about uh, Mary Douglas and, and the way that she conceptualized the intersection between uh, risk and uh, impurity. So basically, this is where the, where the connection with security also comes in, because the Roma are seen as being out of place their morality is seen as being out of place. Uh, and of course, the areas in which they live are seen as uh, non-places and places of squalor and uh, lawlessness.
And so when I was doing my research in Italy, I did I did my research about the, um, the securitization of the Roma between 2014 and 2017. And the reason why I decided to do my ethnography in the peripheries of Rome is that I have found a neighborhood patrol that had mobilized in 2013 to protect their neighborhood of property related crimes, apparently or allegedly on the rise because of the existence of a nearby Roma camp, which happens to be also one of the most infa inf infamous Roma camps in Italy and one of the largest at that point. And so I found a lot of material um, on the internet that were talking about their patrolling very often. And at some point, I also found a video that was um, that was produced by a journalist. And so when I realized that this uh, neighborhood patrol had invited a journalist to go along with them, I thought maybe this is uh, you know a good sign that they could accept me conducting participant observation with them, which they did. But um, maybe we can go into into the details of how I gained access to that later on. I think there will probably be questions my students always ask about how, how did you manage to get there, right? And the reason I really wanted to do that is that um, previously, most of, I mean, many studies about the Roma and their situation had been done from the perspective of the Roma, which is, of course, absolutely, uh, absolutely good and, and valid. But nobody had uh, or very, very few people had taken a look at how at who actually polices the Roma and who is actually, you know, against them and who does what. Um, there are a couple of, of my colleagues, notably Manuel Mirano, for example, who did his PhD, among other things, on Hungarian patrols, Hungarian far-right patrols that also go after Roma, um, right? And there's a couple of other people who have done that, um, but it was still under-researched. And so this is why I, I started to migrate from Romani studies to, uh, you know, urban insecurity and, and formal and informal policing. Um, so uh, tell us, because you in one of your articles, uh, you mentioned that anthropology doesn't really have a coherent approach um, to looking at morality as a, a, a crucial dimension of security. And, and this is obviously in an age where we talk about security, security, security. So, so tell us a little bit about your perspective with that. Absolutely. So um, I situate my work at the intersection between security and morality for several reasons. Um, one of them is that uh, the anthropology of security and the anthropology of morality have grown in parallel. So they, they kind of emerged at the same time, but never, never really in dialogue with each other. Right. And so that that is very, very strange because actually policing and social control has a lot to do and securitization has a lot to do with the moral criteria that people use in order to isolate certain groups as being, uh, you know, risky, uh, as being at risk sometimes as being dangerous and so on. So there is this absence in the literature in the way in which security and morality are being theorized. Uh, now, the article that you mentioned was published in the Journal of Extreme Anthropology, which was actually about security and morality. So that is that is already a sort of you know, uh, ground laying work that has been done by, by by the contributors to the special issue. But I am in the process of also writing up my monograph about the research that I've carried out in Rome, uh, precisely dealing with the, the intersection between security and morality. And the way I take a look at security and morality, the way I, I sort of operationalize that intersection is by taking a look at the law. Because there are security laws, uh, urban security laws and national security laws that encapsulate very, very well the kind of moral understandings that we have about what it means to be a safe citizen, what it means to be a dangerous non-citizen very often, and what needs to be done in order to exclude those uh, deemed uh, um, dangerous from the urban space. And this was the case in Italy, where we have very clearly uh, security laws and urban security decrees um, that have, uh, you know, e even though they, they didn't uh, nominate the Roma because that would be a case of discrimination, so that, that would be illegal. But in, in the in the uh, legislative talks that led to those uh, to, to the um, you know to those laws being adopted, it was clear that the Roma were targeted. 
uh, and we have a series of uh, Italian researchers who have um, written about that. All right, so, so alongside that, in one of your articles, you say, quote, the politics of home involves thus the belief that some are more entitled to inhabit particular places than others. So what, what, what does this mean? So how are we othering people uh, like the Roma? Right, exactly. This is exactly what the, the neighborhood patrol in Rome is doing, right? In the sense that they, they sort of normatively, they produce... Um, visually, they produce the neighborhood as being entirely white and entirely middle class and entirely, of course, uh, you know, law abiding and tax paying and deserving citizens and hardworking, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so the, the, the moral figure of the Italian who is entitled to inhabit that particular suburb is very, very clearly produced visually by these uh, by this patrol who has a, a series of Facebook pages and posts uh, images. Uh, on on their Facebook profile, um, for example, one of the most recurring um, vis visual elements that that they post are people walking, um, and very often they are uh, brown and black people who walk in a post pedestrian neighborhood. And now I, I think I mentioned already that I am very interested in the intersection between insecurity and urban space, because I think that this is really the the, the setting in which we can observe uh, the workings of insecurity and the grassroots security practices that these people enact. Uh, and in a post-pedestrian neighborhood, and we know, of course, with Henri Levebre, who, who was already talking about uh, the changes that the, the car had brought to, to the way in which life is being lived in neighborhoods, right? And in a post-pedestrian neighborhood, a dormitory neighborhood in which people have their cars and they even, even to go to the shopping mall at the, at the edge of the neighborhood, they use their cars. So there are, the presence of pedestrians on, on the sidewalks is, is very limited. Uh, and generally, people without the means to have a car um, walk on the streets, and they happen to be, you know, immigrants, uh, Roma as well. And so um, they are really clearly being targeted. And now this neighborhood patrol posts images of uh, brown and black uh, people walking on the streets, um, you know, sometimes without even uh, adding a text. So it's very, very obvious to them what they mean. They mean, you know, that there has already been a transgression, that the danger is amidst us, that what they're doing is uh, justified because of the presence of these people amidst us, right? Um, and so this idea that some people are more entitled than others to inhabit particular places, of course, is has been called domo politics, so the politics of home. So how people think about the home is very, very important in order to understand who they um, who they exclude and who is not entitled to um, to have a life there, right? Uh, without knowing, of course, that there um, that many of the children from the Roma camp next door actually go to the school that is in the neighborhood, right? So. Um, yeah, there, there is a completely legitimate presence in the neighborhood of people that they do not deem um, legitimate, whose presence they do not de deem legitimate in the urban space. Yeah, and there's a, um, an anthropologist who I uh, quoted in my own, my master's thesis or, or whatever, uh, way back when, uh, by the name of Benson, and he looked at uh, structural violence of, uh, of immigrant workers on farms, uh, and he posited, now I don't think he originally created this concept, the, the concept of faceality, this idea that we imagine certain groups to have certain faces and then they're supposed to have a certain status. But there's also, he mentions this, this concept of purity, you know, via Mary Douglas, as we, as we were mentioning early, that we have this idea of this kind of pure uh, citizen within the home space and the politics of home, as you're mentioning. And uh, it, it seems like that kind of overlaps a lot here, too, as well. 
Absolutely, yeah. And I do want to talk about something else, which I think is very, very important, because we are in, in what has been called the security paradigm, you know, and there is an entire field or a subfield of anthropology called the anthropology of security um, that is that has been emerging in the last 20 years or so. And um, the idea is that the, the, the security paradigm has been, you know, has emerged since the 70s. And now what happened in the 70s is that capitalism produced a number of crises and the crisis that capitalism produced actually accelerated with time until today where we know very well where we are in terms of the kind of, of havoc that, that capitalism wreaks, right? And um, the very concrete example that I can give is the way in which urban space, and in particular this neighborhood in the periphery of Rome that I have, uh, where I've conducted my ethnographic fieldwork, is very interesting um, because it has been, um, you know, there have there has been quantitative research that was done um, on the relationship between the availability of public squares and public places where people could gather in the neighborhood and kind of socialize naturally, you know, discuss politics or, you know, everyday life, whatever they do, um, and the feeling of insecurity. And so what happens is that uh, with this neighborhood, the proportion between the space that was allocated to apartments that were sold, obviously, for profit, and the public space was um, very much skewed in favor of, um, you know, profit making. It, meaning that about 90% of, of the entire neighborhood was allocated to apartments and, and very few spaces were, were left for natural socializing, right? And um, that has, it, it has been also shown in other quantitative research that um, the propensity of people to vote for the far right is correlates with the availability or the lack of availability of public spaces in the neighborhoods. So this is really, really interesting. Um, what I found was was really a, a very little uh, and limited research. And so I wanted to to sort of um, you know go more into depth in in qualitative terms during doing ethnography. And um, you know, of course, we do ethnography with our body, our body is our instrument of measurement, right? And um, I found something very, very interesting, you know, because it's a post-pedestrian neighborhood and, and there are no, there aren't many people walking on the street, but I was walking on the street for my ethnography. Um, it is the first time, really, and I have been in, in, and I have lived in the Netherlands in the most dangerous, you know, between inverted commas, the most dangerous neighborhood of the country, right? Um, and in this neighborhood in the eastern periphery of Rome, it's the first time that I really felt um, scared. You know, and so I, I kind of, I found myself looking behind to see if somebody was following me simply because there is nobody on the streets otherwise, right? Or very few people. And so it's really, really interesting what the the way in which so in which urban space is um, is being administered and arranged and constructed, and what it does to us um, in terms of feelings of of security and insecurity. So to clarify here, what you're saying is that when there is less publicly accessible space, there is a higher propensity for far right organizations and far Absolutely. and more uh, concepts of insecure or greater concepts of insecurity. That's fascinating. Absolutely. So yes, absolutely. And the link is insecurity because, you know, if you don't have spaces in, an, in a neighborhood where people could gather and, and socialize naturally, right, um, then they end up not knowing each other very well. And so if they don't know each other very well, uh, we know what happens, right? And, and in this periphery of Rome, it's, it's very telling because I actually did, did my research in, in two neighborhoods. One is, uh, is an older neighborhood, actually, um, it's an old neighborhood and a, and a neighborhood that was kind of militant uh, on, on the left side until recently, um, where people know each other, where people share the space on the street, the cafes are full, the restaurants are full, everybody knows about everybody. And so there's a lot of sociality going on, right? And the neighborhood of uh, that I was talking about, uh, in which there is no so sociability on the street, and there was actually in 2015 uh, a story that um, 
and that was published in, in the local press about a lady whose corpse was found in her apartment 22 months after her death. And the neighbors had noticed um, the smell and had notified the police, but because the police didn't have a mandate to break the door, um, they just said that they couldn't do anything. And what the neighbors did was they actually sellotaped the door so that the smell doesn't uh, come out anymore. So, wow. which is shocking in terms, exactly. It's, it's shocking in terms of what it means for a type of, of sociality in which, you know, neighbors don't care about each other anymore. They, they don't know each other, right? And so um, many inhabitants of this neighborhood actually commented under the, the article that appeared in the online press about the quality uh, the texture that the, that the neighborhood has, and they, they were deploring the fact that social ties are being lost. And the interesting thing is, where are the social ties displaced towards? The shopping mall at the margin of the neighborhood. And this is really interesting because our social ties are now not taking place, you know, anymore in the in the in the in the urban space, but taking place in a place of consumerism, in a place that is glis, you know, glittering and and shiny and incredibly clean. I mean, it's it's unnaturally clean, right? Um, and where where there are security guards everywhere, and the security guards uh, prohibit the entrance to those that are not fitting the figure of 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 the citizen that consumes, right? And it's really interesting, um, really interesting how this this kind of, of transition, right, that sociality uh, is transitioning towards places of consumerism, that is, it's reflected in, in politics, for example. I think it happened in 2015 or 16, if I'm not mistaken, that, um, you know, in the European Union, we have the directorates, director, uh, director general for, um, for justice changed its name surreptitiously and unexplainably to um, citizens, uh, to uh, director general for uh, consumers protection, you know, so um or or some, something like that i don't remember exactly the, the the exact title but suddenly there was this figure of the consumer that is really really important and whose whose rights need to be protected right which also means that the poor you know those who do not uh, conform to that kind of figure are again being othered and again being sort of excluded from the public sphere right yes yeah, so that's that sounds a lot like uh you know i what it sounds to me like is what you're saying is that as we become our public space and our public interactions move to spaces of consumerism, it increasingly demonizes those who are not consuming as much. Right. And, and that, that sounds very much in relation to, you know, the rise of neoliberalism in the late 70s and early 80s and this idea that you are what you consume and uh, that, you know, you deregulate these systems because your identity is all wrapped up in consumption. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, in terms of how he, here in the United States we treat the homeless and how we have all these kinds of sweeps of their camps all the time, uh, you know, and all this precarity with them, uh, even though there are very simple solutions. In, in some cities like Salt Lake City, for example, you know, built tiny house villages, and it, it's turned out very well. They've solved a lot of the problems. But instead, you know, in, in cities like Denver, for example, we don't do a very good job uh, of managing the homeless, and, and we demonize them instead of actually providing relief. Um, it, you know, and it, it's funny because it ends up turns out that it is actually cheaper for the city to solve the problem because Salt Lake City found it was it was something like a hundred thousand dollars a year less to just give them a tiny house community and a community garden and all this stuff than it was to uh, than it was to just keep throwing them in prison all the time. You know, um, so so it's really interesting that stuff. And, and to comment on your other point about uh, you know this this idea that. Um, Communities that have less public space tend to have more far right groups and more, you know, prejudice and, and things that makes a lot of sense in my own research. And what I found working with a social justice theater troupe is that, you know, when most people went and saw these plays they they were just like, I just didn't know. 
I didn't know this was happening. And so it's kind of just about exposure. Uh, and, and that so that does make a, a great deal of sense that um, exposure would change people's minds because it's really easy to demonize someone you have virtually no contact with or you only have these anecdotes on social medias about the criminal element or the, the, you know, the dirty immigrant or these various other terrible stereotypes. But then when you actually talk to them and realize that they're people because you share public space or you, your kids play you know, sports together or, or you go to concerts together, various other things in the park – uh, it does make sense that you know the increased mm-hmm. isolation like that in the public sphere is is going to uh, change our perceptions and, and double down on kind of xenophobia. So, yeah, absolutely. Although I, I would like to add one one important thing is that there are, for example, in the margins of um, of large cities. I'm thinking about Paris now, right? There, there's the banlieue where um, you know people are packed um, in also you know, neighborhoods in which there is a lack of public spaces, but the sociality is different there, right? I mean, people visit each other all the time. Uh, we are specifically talking about newer neighborhoods that uh, you you would call dormitory neighborhoods, right? Where people don't know each other. So I don't want to make it sound like, you know, that, that kind of, uh, the lack of space is the only variable that changes everything and that motivates people you know but it's also it, it is about the quality of sociality and it is about the feeling of insecurity in the urban space right and i think people i think you know people in in the banlieue don't necessarily feel uh, insecure when they belong there because they know everybody and uh, sociality is happening in a different place now for someone who doesn't belong there who doesn't live there very often you'd hear oh don't go there that's a really dangerous area which of course it is right i mean <laughs> yeah, and that, that's actually a good uh, point for me to ask. And we're running out of just time for the discussion. And we're going to do uh, questions here in, in a minute after I ask this one question of Anna. Um, so if you have your questions, do feel free to post them uh, in the live chat feed here. Um, so uh, there's a lot of perception, and, and I hear this perception all the time from Europe and from the United States and all of these different places. And there's this perception that minority or distinct ethnic groups in their their neighborhoods are accused of having higher crime rates right mm-hmm. and you talk about this in one of their article uh, this your articles that this is like a perception but it almost never proves to be true so so can you can actually uh, talk about that a little bit yeah, I mean, it's very clearly so that uh, communities, uh, you know, minorities and communities that are um, anyway shunned and uh, constructed as being different and being inferior on the social um, social hierarchies are policed much more arduously. So, it, you know, in the in the banlieues of Paris, for example, there is Didier Fasson who did his ethnography of policing uh, who shows that very well you know and um policing is is very often mediated by the skin color for example um i think we lost uh, anna again for one moment ah here we go okay okay i'm back go ahead yeah yeah, and so you know, this is. But what I'm, uh, I actually want to talk a little bit about the project that I'm on right now, um, because I'm I finished the project in in Italy, and because I found this phenomenon of informal policing extremely interesting, uh, and rapidly growing in Europe, um, you know, I I started to take a look at what happens in other contexts in Italy. And I am doing at the moment a comparative ethnography of neighborhood patrols or civilian defense groups. You know, it depends how you how you want to call them in Germany and in the Netherlands. And my project is called The Rise of Informal Policing in Europe, Security, Space, State. And this is really the intersection that I'm trying to explore through this ethnography of, of these groups, which, of course, because of the pandemic, could not take place though in the way I would have wanted to. Of course. Um, the questions that I am um, that I am working on are, you know, why why do such patrols emerge in some neighborhoods and not others? And in how much uh, is it similar or, you know, how, how can I compare it to what I found in Italy regarding um, urban space and the propensity of, of these patrols to, to appear, right? Um, and uh, in Germany, for example, the number of such patrols uh, grew exponentially after the so-called uh, Sylvester night 
in 2016, where in Cologne there were a lot of uh, issues that were allegedly, you know, perpetrated by by Moroccans or by um, you know, North Africans. And so as a result of that, the far right party, one of the far right parties in, in Germany, the NPD, um, has called for a general mobilization of the citizenry in uh, these neighborhood patrols, right? So it really was a, a phenomenon. And in the Netherlands, between 2012 and 2016, the number of such patrols multiplied by five. Um, and right now there are there are patrols in almost all of the neighborhoods. Uh, I mean, almost all of the municipalities. So it's really a very disturbing phenomenon, right? And a phenomenon that also raises very interesting theoretical questions about what happens to the state when the citizens decide to take uh, security and protection in their own hands. Um, and the response of the police is different in different contexts, but uh, basically um, very often they do, um, they, they're not very happy about these groups and they're very aware of the, the risk of violence. Um, and um, But on the other hand, you know, they promote neighborhood watch schemes. Uh, that they say, well, you know, this is a much better way of being a, a good citizen and of serving your community. So actually, what happens is not that the state is kind of retrenching like we would think under neoliberalism when the citizens take things in their own hands, but the function of, of surveillance and policing is being sort of capillarized um, and extended through through citizens. So it's it, these are very interesting questions that I'm addressing in my work and yeah. my project. Well, and it sounds like there's a lot of overlap here uh, with, you know, stand your ground laws here in the United States and, and like the case of uh, Trayvon Martin, for example, very famous case here in the United States, uh, you know, where George Zimmerman uh, ended up killing him uh, in a confrontation as a neighborhood watch uh, rep representative of sorts. Right. And so it's really interesting because, um, you know, at the same time, I've noticed as a, from a media anthropology perspective is that. Uh, the state will rise up and protect those individuals' identity and, and uh, create all kinds of justifications uh, because, uh, you know, these neighborhood patrols are, are something that they – I don't know if it's because they struggle to control them or they just become an additional arm of surveillance or, or and then this, the monopoly of violence that, that's enacted by the states or, or how that all works. But it definitely has been interesting to watch to see that as these things happen, you know, the, even the citizens – uh, are, are very much treated in the same way when we have cases of pre police brutality and you see you know, the, the media apparatus and the state to make all kinds of justifications and you see them all over uh, you know, social media as well. So. Absolutely, yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm going to open things up for questions and uh, you know, as we're waiting for questions, you can certainly continue uh, discussing. I mean, we could, we could talk about this stuff all day. You've written uh, you know, several very brilliant articles uh, which I will, uh, you know, you have, you can find in the links in the description here. Uh, and an, another thing I wanted to say real quick was, um, you know, and I forgive me, I'll have to look for the link and, and put it in the description myself. But there was this great article by, uh, I think it was a sociologist uh, who wrote about perceptions of violence of immigrants, uh, specifically undocumented immigrants and refugees, uh, and this idea that they're somehow more violent. And then when you actually do an analysis of, of, of criminal cases, what you see is that uh, refugees and undocumented immigrants are far less likely to commit crimes, in part because I'm sure they're they're in a precarious situation. They they don't you know their, their situation. They they want to avoid trouble. So this idea that somehow uh, refugees and immigrants are more likely to commit crime just it has there's no evidence really behind it, at least not in the, definitely not in the United States, according to this anthropologist or sociologist. Um, but uh, I, I'm sure that's the same case uh, across Europe as well. So, Absolutely. And actually, you know, um, paradoxically, if, if you take that narrative as, uh, you know, the mainstream narrative about the, the criminality of the refugee, refugees and undocumented migrants are very often actually model citizens because they cannot afford any kind of trouble with the police because then they, you know, um, they, certainly in the case of undocumented migrants, right? Um, yeah. Uh, and also, uh, there's a, a great book that talks about the, the problematic nature of police algorithms in, in one of the chapters. It's called Weapons of Math Destruction. 
uh, you know, math as in, you know, algorithmic math, right? And so there's all these algorithmic systems uh, that kind of create this feedback loop in certain neighborhoods. So it looks like there's more crimes, but most of the crimes are things like jaywalking and, and petty theft and, and really nonviolent crimes. But because the, the, the computer algorithm says put more police in this neighborhood, concurrently then there's more uh, arrests and there's more, you know, convictions in that area. So it, it can it increasingly look Looks like you know these particular neighborhoods have more crime, but the reality is that crime isn't more or less in other night neighborhoods, particularly uh, all white neighborhoods. That crime is just as prevalent. It's just that the police are there to, and and then this feeds into the algorithm, and so it looks like there's more crime in, in some of those places, even though you know a lot of these things are really minor offenses. Absolutely, exactly. And the thing is, I mean, the flabbergasting question is why people why are people increasingly afraid when crime statistics show consistently a decrease right i mean even even if you look only at, at the example of italy right in the 70s and 80s you had political violence you had the mafia wars you had a lot of really violent stuff happening on the street and yet People are much more insecure now and much feel much much more unsafe now than they did back then, right? Yeah, um, I, I think part of that, uh, and this is uh, anthropo. Uh, I can't remember if he's a sociologist, but social scientist Peter Dreyer talks about. He wrote an article called "How Media Compounds Urban Problems," uh, and what he demonstrates in his article. This is like a 2005 article, but it still rings very true. Um, is that we have these if it bleeds it leads media systems and so uh he for example looked at murder rates uh in la uh murder accounted for 20 percent of the coverage of media but it accounts for less than one percent of the crime and so we have these constant 24-hour news cycles and this constant systems uh that are making us think we're in more danger and yet we're actually not. But then that creates all kinds of additional xenophobia because, and Dreyer points this out too, that you know when you look at criminal, what you see is uh, you know uh, the, the people who are considered subaltern or minorities or, or, or various oppressed groups, uh, and, and you know, and you'll see, for example, them with a terrible mugshot, whereas you'll see the white the white criminal is often you know with their lawyers or something, and so you'll see different, completely different perspective as uh, you know where you have these different ideas or perceptions about how these individuals are presented. Uh, and I think also, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that one of the, the drivers of this fear is inequality, because if your livelihood is constantly threatened, if your, you know, your cost of living is rising while your wages are flat, which is definitely, you know, the United States is currently at, at one of the highest points of uh, inequality since records began. Um, and uh, so if you look at those, those kinds of factors here, you start to see people are worried about their, their safety because they need someone else to blame, too. So there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of very dynamic things going on here. Um, Absolutely, for sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is actually also true in the case of Rome, where the Observatory for Security of uh, the Latium, so the area where where the province of Rome is situated, did a research in which they um, they correlated you know which variables, which personal variables. Um, with um, are more m most important for the feeling of insecurity. And of course, the, the feeling of insecurity correlates with gender uh, in the sense that women feel more insecure on the streets, um, unsafe, I, I should say. Um, you know, uh, the level of education as well, and so on and so forth, the, the political orientation, because, you know, far right, some people do buy m much more into these fear narratives than others, right? Um, but the one variable that explained the best, that correlated the strongest, was the experience of economic precarity within the last 12 months. So for people who had experienced job loss or income loss, um, you know, or the experience of precarity, um, whether it was themselves or, or someone in their family, were much more prone to express feelings of um, being unsafe. Um, in the urban space, right? So that is extremely important. So there is a process of precarization that has led us to being absolutely neurotically afraid 
of people, um, of one another, and especially of those who don't look like us, right? I mean, yeah. this is this is very telling and it happens in in a whole bunch of contexts i mean and and so and so few of us especially now in the age of algorithms are so isolated in in who we communicate with and who we uh Mm -hmm. you know really get to know and we just don't we just don't you know it's not like the old days where you know the the, and obviously i'm romanticizing a little here which isn't always a good thing to do either but but a lot of a lot of you know, um, you know, the mid mid twentieth century, you had a lot of situations where you had unions and people were all a part of union, regardless of their ethnicity, and they worked together in the same factory. And you know, you you had picnics, uh, company picnics together, and there was there was lots more interaction. But as these things kind of went away, and as you have more segregated communities, in fact, in the United States, uh, we're at a very high rate of segrega- segregation. Uh, I know schools are. Uh, around similar levels to say of segregation, uh, you know, via race as they were, you know, in the time around Brown versus board education right now. And so, and so you get a lot of, a lot of isolation in these communities. And when you're not talking, then you just get kind of these, you know, conversations, you know, each side, these people are all talking not to each other, but they're talking to their own groups and they don't, they don't interact. And so you Absolutely. get you get all kinds of misunderstanding and, and you know isolation and, and uh, mm-hmm. you know uh, no no chance to understand why someone is different and how they're similar. Mm-hmm. So. Exactly, exactly. I would say much more how they're similar. Uh, absolutely. And one more thing that I wanted to add when you were talking about you know um, these narratives about crime is the idea of moral panics. Right. And that is yet again one of the intersections between security and morality, where, uh, you know, in in very moralizing terms, we're talking about uh, crimes and who perpetrates uh, crimes and so on and so forth. So it's really a a very rich nexus that um, that remains to be explored yet. I'm not sure whether I lost you again. You're frozen on my image. Oh, do you still hear me? I, I can see you just fine. Oh, maybe maybe I'm losing connection here. So. Hopefully that's not the case. Right. Okay. Oh, back. back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everything is fine. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. I, I didn't see any delay for me, so I, I don't know what happened. Hopefully YouTube figured it out. So, <laughs> but um, oh, what was I going to say? Uh, what were you just saying about um? Oh, we were we were talking about uh, you know perception and equality, all this various other stuff. Um, and Absolutely. I, yeah. yeah. And. So, and moral panics and how that panic. that is the one thing again. I was going to say is there there is a lot of money to be made out of moral panic right because you have all the the militarization oh. of police someone makes those makes all that uh, all that stuff uh, you know someone makes the guns or for profit prisons or uh, you know increased times for um, parole and, and so you know monetization and, and hyper surveillance of minority groups there's so much money to be made off of moral panic. And so there's kind of a, a capitalistic incentive to create more moral panic as well. And so that's that's another dimension here too. Absolutely. The dimension of the market is really, really important in that in that uh, respect. And we see that, you know, the need is created so that there is a product that actually covers that need. And we can talk also about, you know, pepper sprays and, um, you know, self-defense trainings i mean not only security companies and weapons and so on and so forth but really um towards more sort of finer details right right yeah. it, it, you know in the united in the united states for example there's this whole narrative of you know the democrats are trying to take our guns but and so you see what you yeah. actually see is there's this every time a democrat takes office you see this huge spike in gun sales right and so that you know of course there, there's great things uh, there's lots of money to be made in this. Uh, we do have a question uh, mm-hmm. by uh, Mihaela. Uh, my boyfriend, who is English, tells me that he's seen over the past 10 years or more that the TV would broadcast messages about insecurity linked to immigration as if panic uh, was an aim from the start. So what are your thoughts on that one? Absolutely. I absolutely agree. But I mean, you know, it's the question is who is behind it? And I think it's a collective process in which it's not only the media that is uh, to blame as a sort of personified, um, you know, uh, 
element with agency, right? I mean, who works in the media is also people, right? And of course, in the media, we're looking for uh, sensationalism, we're looking for stories that can increase the audience. And so what fascinates very often, unfortunately, is you know, our stories of violence and stories of uh, stories of uh, in which the figure of the stranger, um, you know, figure prominently. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, people love people love to be enthralled by, you know, danger. I mean, that's why we see action movies and read thrillers and horror and all this other stuff. Right. And so those things, yeah. those things sell very well. Uh, especially Absolutely. the thriller, yeah. you know, especially, you know, how many police procedural programs or, or, or shows do we have out there, right? And so, uh, obviously, they sell very well, and that this idea of the danger of crime is is a very um, uh, a kind of a salient uh, approach here. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, in their 2016 book, uh, The Truth About Crime, this is precisely what Jean and John Komarov are talking about. And it's a it's a really interesting book that I recommend to everyone interested in these kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I hadn't uh, no, I hadn't read that book myself until I read your articles, I, and then I was like, oh, I got to read this one for sure. So I'll definitely be checking that one out. So we have about five minutes uh, remaining, and I, I just thought maybe you would tell us about how you got permission to hang out with yeah. this group because you did say that earlier, and that your students often ask that question, and. I think people would be fascinated to hear how you kind of were, you know, you got into the group to do your ethnography, uh, especially, you know, a lot of those groups would certainly view anthropologists or social scientists as an enemy. So, so I'm kind of curious how you, how you sort of uh, approach that. Yeah, it's a really funny story um, because I did two weeks of preliminary field work in Italy, in Milan and Rome, in order to choose the place where I would actually settle for my ethnography. And so I found this group in Rome and I had contacted them through their Facebook page. And I sent a message saying, I am a researcher based in Germany and I do this and that. And I would like to meet up with you and interview you. And I didn't get any, any response. But one day before I had to leave, so when I sort of like, was okay I, I have nothing to lose so I'm just going to call the number and at that point since it was the beginning of my research my Italian was approximate you know I mean I, I was using French and Spanish and Romanian and a mixture of them in order to 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 speak Italian and so I, I really didn't want to call them also because I would I I was thinking that they would pick up on my Romanian accent and Romanians are really criminalized a lot in Italy. So I didn't expect them to be very friendly with me, you know, finding out that, that, that I was Romanian. And when I called them, the leader of the patrol who picked up the phone interrupted me right away and said, oh, yes, 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 I, I meant to answer you, but I didn't have time. I'm sorry for that. But before anything, I just wanted to tell you how much I admire you people. And my reaction was, you know, what does he mean? What, what do you mean, you people? Who is you people? Is that anthropologist? Like you said, I, you know, I very much doubt this. Um, Romanians even less. So what, what did he actually mean? And I asked him, you know. And so he started with a very long uh, tirade in which he was talking about how, well, you guys, you have respect for authority and for discipline and for the rules and, um it slowly dawned on me that he mistook me for a German. And in, in Europe, Germans are, you know, stereotyped that way as being very punctual and very disciplined and, you know, authoritarian a little. And, and all these kinds of, of stereotypes actually afforded me access to them. And he wanted to, to see me. He agreed to see me. And because I was going to leave the next day, I asked if they were going on patrol that particular night. And when he said yes, then I, I proposed that I accompany them on the patrol. And so that was my first patrol with them from 11, 11. 30 until 5 a.m. in the morning. Now, in hindsight, I'm thinking I was completely irresponsible because I was going with a people that, with a group of people that I knew were were you know they were they weren't the nicest of people. You know, I mean, the kind of racism and the kind of instigation to violence on their Facebook page, um, I had seen that right um, in a neighborhood that I didn't know. 
moreover, you know, and at night and in their cars. So now I'm thinking, what, what was I thinking, right? Especially because after I came back from field work, um, the leader of the patrol posted at a certain point a gun on his Facebook page. And he said something like, uh, yeah, this, uh, you know, gypsy crime. Well, I would have the solution if the laws of this country would allow me to use my gun, but, you know, they don't. So I'll just wait until they do. And then I'll, I'll be able to do something good for all of us, you know. So and I did a, I, I did um, witness discussions of lynching uh, a Roma person. Uh, to teach them a lesson, which is again an element of morality that is very, very uh, important because every time that there is um, a question of lynching or a question of, you know, doing something, taking things in our own hands uh, to show them a lesson, to teach them a lesson, right? So it's it's a very moralistic kind of paradigm that they're in as well. Yeah, and, and obviously a lot of these kinds of conversations happen here with communities of color in the United States. They happen with refuge, Syrian refugees all over Europe. They happen with, uh, you know, I've heard these kinds of conversations about Native American communities here in the United States. So it's, it's just, you know, any group that is different from the dominant yeah. society, uh, you know, especially in those times of, of uh, you know, sociocultural stress for, for a variety of reasons you get you they get this kind of stuff but um yeah uh any final <laughs> thoughts or anything anything you'd like to say or a anything you'd like to uh you know propose for people to consider um you know uh as we wrap up here well um i forgot to mention that my project is funded by the gada henkel foundation which i really want to mention um you know and i'm hoping to to carry out this ethnography and to find out more Although now with Corona, of course, the phenomenon has receded. So the dynamics regarding security in the urban space have changed a little, right? So um, it remains an open question. Um, what I would really like to emphasize is to think about, um, you know, what, what we're afraid of and in what terms and why, and to be very mindful of those constructions that we tend to take over, sometimes without thinking, maybe sometimes, uh, you know, uncritically about who is dangerous and why, and to think about, um, about the kind of links that we find between that kind of fear and the economic situation in which we're right now, in which there is so much insecurity. And very often that economic insecurity is being translated into all kinds of fears, right? Yeah, and I imagine so, the, the post the COVID recovery time I, that these things are probably really heightened. I certainly, I think a lot of, I personally think that a lot of, a lot of this, um, uh, anti-mask rhetoric had more to do with in economic insecurity than anything else. But I, I think there's a direct link there, but, but I, that, that's a whole entirely different topic. So, but uh, thank you so much uh, for coming today, Anna. We really appreciate you sharing your work and your ideas with us. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, definitely. If you're watching this, uh, check out um, Anna's uh, research, you, you'll be a link down in the description. And you can also check out uh, my work, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, book Build Better Worlds, an introduction to anthropology for game designers, fiction writers, and filmmakers, or my uh, anthropology YouTube series, Anthropology in 10 or Less. So thank you so much, Anna, for joining us today. I think I may have lost you. It looks like your screen froze, but, uh, but, uh, but, do th but thank you very much for coming today. So... And thanks for tuning in, everybody. See you next time.